For those of you who don't know, um, Citizens Online has been um, going since the year 2000. We work around the UK, helping organisations ensure that the digital age we now live in um, doesn't exclude people. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Citizens Online One. Uh, my name is David Skur. I'm Partnerships and Project Manager. You can find me on Twitter at David underscore Skur. And I'm joined by James Beecher, who's Research Manager, um, who you can also find on Twitter at James D. Beecher. Um, the session plan for today, um, first of all, James will provide a quick introduction to um, the problem we're trying to solve. Um, we will then share some, reflex some reflections on online privacy and security from ourselves um, and hear from um, a special guest, uh, Phil Brannigan, who's digital champion at Digital Unite, who will share some top tips on um, privacy and security. There'll then be some space to um, answer some of your questions after this section on, on privacy. And we will, we will then share some safeguarding tips and um, discuss some of the challenges around safeguarding when providing remote digital skills support. First of all, before we do this, um, I'm going to um, launch this poll to find out a little bit more about who we have on the call. Um, just bear with me. Okay, I'm going to read um, the options out as the recording doesn't capture this. So um, you should see the question, who do we have on the call coming up on your screens with the options. I work on privacy and security specifically. I am currently offering remote support. I was offering support before distancing, or I'm just interested. Um, there's 33 participants currently on the call. I can see some answers coming in. We've got about 23 answers now. We'll leave it a little longer before we share the results. Okay, we've got 31 answers out of 33. A few more seconds. Okay, most one more person to vote. We'll end the poll now and I'll share the results and um, read them out. So we've got um, just a couple of you working on privacy and security specifically. Um, please do share some of your tips uh, and resources during the session. Again, please post these on the chat. Um, over just over half of you, 56% currently offering remote support, which is fantastic. Hopefully the session was, will be really helpful, um, especially around those questions of safeguarding. Um, and some of you were offering support before distancing, uh, just under half, 44%. And another quarter of you just interested. So good mix there. And um, it's nice to have uh, participants from um, different places. We've got um, participants from um, Surrey, Leeds, Southampton, Hertfordshire, Brighton and Hove. So um, a good mix of people. Um, if you are already providing support, uh, please do feel free to share in the chat any useful tips you might have or some of the challenges you're facing so we can draw on those um, during the, the discussions. So really briefly, the problem that we're trying to address today is, as we say every week, we know that those who are most at risk from the virus are also those who are most likely to be digitally excluded. In short, if you're older or if you are disabled, which might be related to a long-term health condition, then you're less likely to have digital skills and you're less likely to be online in general. In Specifically with regard to the issues we're talking about today, we know that people who are not users of the internet are much more likely to be concerned with internet privacy threats. 72% <clears throat> of people who aren't using the internet say that they are compared to 52% of people who are internet users. And obviously half of internet users saying that they're concerned about privacy is a really significant portion anyway. Last week on our session, which you can watch uh, on our website, citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events, we talked about the Lloyd's Consumer Digital Index report. And one of the findings in that report is that things around privacy, things relevant kind of questions about 
the ability to easily stop organizations using someone's data or more transparency about the data that organizations are collecting. These are things that could encourage people to get online who are not currently online. We know that there is a kind of tension between people's concern and their use. So for a lot of people who are using the internet, they use things that they might not necessarily be happy with. So 90% of people pretty much say that they think companies should be doing more to make terms and conditions more understandable. But currently, uh, nearly two thirds and at least half sign up either without reading those terms and conditions or without being able to understand them. And a big chunk, for over 40%, say that there's not much point reading those terms and conditions because companies do what they want anyway or because they need to use the services. So regardless of what was in the terms and conditions, people would be signing up to them. People feel that they have no choice. And only a very small minority, only 25%, say they just trust technology companies and don't need to understand them. This is some research from um, dot of, dot Everyone, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. There's also research from the Oxford Internet Institute, which finds, which is the, the stat that I referred to earlier, that 52% of internet users agree that the internet threatens privacy. What's interesting about that data is that if you go on to ask people about what actions they've taken to protect their privacy, many people haven't taken any action. And we can assume that that's because they don't know how to take action on those things or don't have the skills. And that's an area where we as digital champions can perhaps help. One thing that we have been saying on previous sessions and want to reiterate is that when we talk about privacy and security, we need to be conscious of the fact that raising the fears of people who are offline can make them more reluctant to get onto the internet. And this is also true for people who have low or no digital skills, but who are online. We want to be able to reassure people that if they take certain steps, they can be relatively safe online and that they can still access the benefits of the internet but we need to be giving them clear information about how to, to protect themselves. We've written up some of what we think about this in a blog post on our website, which links to the research by the Oxford Internet Institute and Dot Everyone that I've just sort of very briefly talked about. So if you'd like to read more about that, then please uh, have a look at this blog. And this is a good point to mention that all the slides will be sent out to you at the end of the session. So don't worry if you're not quite picking up everything that you'd, you'd like to right at the moment. It may also be worth saying just before we get on to Phil that if you haven't yet introduced yourself in the chat, then please do so. I know a lot of you have already, but some, we've had some people join the call since then. So if you'd like to just drop a little message in the chat to say who you are and, and what you're interested in today, then please do. So over to Phil. Ah, good. I've been unmuted. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, David. Uh, it's nice to be here. My name's Phil Brannigan. I'm one of the digital champions with Digital Unite. And like James said, our little PowerPoint presentation has got a lot of detail on it. But please don't be worried about making notes or anything because it's all going to be sent to you anyway. So you'll see a lot of detail on here, but it's all available to you later on. So if I could have the uh, first slide, please. So the first thing we talk about is what is privacy and security, the definitions. So very briefly, as you can see, we've condensed it down into two government recommended statements, which is privacy is a state in which one is not observed or disturbed by other people. And security is the state of being free from danger or threat. And quite simply, that means if you go home and you shut your front door, you should have privacy all the time. And it's something that's a big concern to people at the moment because of electronic devices that sit in houses nowadays. So when you shut your front door, you're not necessarily being private. But like I say, when we go into our digital champions roles, we are always trying to reassure people that with best practice, you don't have to worry too much about your privacy and security. Second slide, please. So what are the actual issues We've got this big statement, again, that was issued by the government and other bodies about your constitutional rights. I'm not going to read through it all for you because you can do that when you read the slides later. But basically, it's about coercion and intimidation. And as you will have seen in the news recently, a lot of that is going on. 
But what I want to do is reassure people that, again, if you set things up properly and you feel comfortable with the devices that you're using, then your privacy can be protected quite easily. It's just about what your level of comfort is. Next slide, please. Security issues. This is the one where I spend the bulk of my time telling people that if you update and you back up things, then you generally don't need to worry about your security issues because updated software takes care of all the patching that needs to be done so that your devices are nice and safe. All your antivirus software is working, so that means that you're protected from any online threats. And then if you're backing up things, if you have the ultimate disaster, you can actually get back to where you were before, so you've not lost anything. So that's the best thing that I'd like everybody to take away from it here, which is two words, backing up and updating, because that's what really keeps your privacy and security in tip-top condition. Okay, next slide, please. So this one is something that everybody I think knows, and it's usually a statement that you hear about, would you say something to your parents that you then post online? It's always about what do you want to share on social media? And we as digital champions have exactly the same sort of ethos as what we're teaching people. Don't overshare things on social media. Don't tell people all your personal details. As digital champions, we protect ourselves because we don't use our personal accounts or our personal devices when we're working. And we do that as best practice. So that's protecting us, but it's also protecting our customers so that there's no interaction, there's no crossover. And that way we keep everybody nice and happy. I personally always go into my meetings with all my software up to date. Everything is backed up. And as it says on the slide, if there's ever a situation where I'm uncomfortable or my user is uncomfortable, we just end the session. It's as simple as that. It's all about your level of comfort with the person you're working with. But also myself as a digital champion, how I feel comfortable wise. Next slide, please. And that brings us on really nicely to the duty of care, because I take that very, very seriously. When I'm working with any, any of my clients who are either vulnerable or they've got mental health issues or they've got dexterity issues, I'm always looking at how I can help that person, but also keep them safe so that they don't feel like they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing or they don't want to do or they're just not comfortable doing. It's a very long, slow process of building up trust so that they know that when they want to do something online, we are teaching them the correct way to do it so that they can actually do it from their point of view and not, which is what we come across a lot of the time, when somebody else takes over the keyboard and then does it for them. That's not what we want. We're all about helping the user to do what they want to do online. So as it says in the slide, I'm always looking away if there's a password being put in. I'm always taking care that nothing is photographed because, because of GDPR, we never write anything down. We never take photographs of any documentation or passwords or notebooks because we don't want to make ourselves liable, but also we don't want the user to feel uncomfortable that their data has gone up somewhere else. Next slide, please. So as I reiterated, the best part about the job that we do is that keeping people up to date with their software is what keeps them nice and safe. We can't go into specific details here, but whatever software product you're using, generally you can always have it automatically updating and whichever the vendor is that you bought it from will have support forums for you. So this is how we actually teach people to turn on their PCs, let automatic updates work, turn on their phones, let the automatic updates work and keep themselves nice and safe. And that way, when we're moving around from place to place, we know that we're keeping people as informed as possible so that they can enjoy using the internet. Because I'd like to reiterate exactly what David and James said about, we don't want people to be scared of using the internet. 
one of the things that we work on is every time Sam, somebody says to me, this bad thing has happened, like there has been an attack and some accounts have been compromised, I always say, well, what's the other side of the coin? How many billions of people have used the internet and the web very safely, done their online shopping, and they feel really good because they've done, a, done something that actually they need to actually be done. So it shouldn't be a problem, really. Um, next slide, please. And this is for anybody who wants extra resources from our Digital Unite website. Um, the link at the bottom will be active when you actually get this in your email. And it's got comprehensive guides on how we look at helping people from a remote point of view. So a remote digital champion is some of the training that I've done. So it means that when I've built up a rapport with somebody, I can actually help them online, talk to them on the phone, then I can actually connect with them via their computer, and then I can help them to do anything they want to do. And it's generally things like setting up email accounts so they can shop, setting up other processes so they can talk to their friends. And it's a nice way of sort of like building up confidence so that in this time when we're all quite isolated, we can all connect with each other and keep each other happy and he healthy and safe. And that's it from me. Great, thanks, Phil. If we um, stop sharing the screen, we can say hello to everyone and have some questions. Um, we've only got the one question in the chat at the moment. Oh, we've got a couple. So, Lee, shall we unmute you and we'll have your question first, I think, if you'd like to say it to everyone. I'm struggling to find you on the screen. Where are you? <laughs> I don't know if you can see Lee. Um, there we are. If I unmute you uh, oh it looks like you might be unmuted already are you there lee are you able to read that question out hi hi can people hear me yeah yeah cool. um so hi there so one of the uh, so i work at the national cyber security center and one of the challenges that we have around our guidance for patching and updating software is that many older phones or devices are stuck on older versions and people can't update them even if they want to and indeed know how to. So yep. this disproportionately affects um, those people who can't just afford to buy the, the Flash's most expensive phone. And I'm wondering if it's something you've come across when working with people to help them feel safe online. Yes, we, we get that quite a bit actually. Um, we do sometimes reach a point where it becomes a barrier because I, I personally experienced it with people who've got like an iPhone 5 wanting to do something like connect to a printer and say, sorry, you know, airdrop's not on air, I, an iPhone 5. So you need to have an iPhone 6. Um, you do get those physical barriers because the software can only be updated so far back. Um, what we're looking at as digital champions is, are there other resources that we can give to people? Are there other ways? So the lending of equipment or using equipment in shared spaces like libraries and IT rooms and everything to enable people to do things. But yeah, we really appreciate that it's very difficult when somebody has got an old device that they cannot physically update. They actually come to a standstill and we're just looking at the ways around that. And it is about actually updating people to the latest equipment that they can afford. So we do look at things like the affordability schemes. Um, I know James has said this in the past about there's a, a £10 package for broadband from BT. So it does get you online. It gives you a very limited service. But if you're on specific benefits, I think you can qualify for it. And then that way it makes things a bit more manageable. But at the moment, I'm not sure if they actually do devices associated with that package. But it's certainly something that we encourage people to look into. David, do you want to say something about this? Because you've had those devices come through recently. Yeah, so I mean, we, we've, we've tried to, we've started sourcing out some uh, devices and lend them out to vulnerable people. We, we have tried to um, really focus on new devices and uh, devices that are really fit for purpose and can be updated um, with the latest systems. Um, and there is quite a lot of, there are quite a lot of people who are really keen on donating old tech. Um, it's really important that we work um, as networks. We work in partnership with organizations that can then repurpose them, um, wipe the data and really give us a judgment whether or not these are, are actually going to be um, fit for purpose when it comes to security, when it comes to latest updates. So it's quite challenging, but we focus on 
new devices that are um, fairly good value uh, and which hopefully overcome um, this, this barrier mentioned by Lee. Yeah, I mean, it, it will be um, prohibitive for a lot of individuals nonetheless, but there is a, there's a Nokia device at around £100, which quite a few of the organisations are either crowded funding for or, or recommending as something to use. And if you're in, your organisation's in a position to be getting devices to people, we can perhaps share some information about that if um, that's helpful. But yeah, in shortly, it's, it's, it's definitely a problem and uh, not necessarily one with an easy fix, really. Um, perhaps leads on to just giving people uh, encouraging people around some of the other tips that they other things that they are will be in control of and other things to be um, cautious around in terms of uh, how they interact online because it, it, it although obviously we would recommend keeping all that stuff up to date it needn't necessarily it doesn't automatically mean that problems are going to arise um, we've got another question from tim do you want to read yours out, Tim? Um, the question I've put down is how does Phil remotely support learners? And I've, I've put down TeamViewer as an example. But yes. It's, it, just to sort of expand on this slightly, I put that in just to put a marker there, really. Um, yeah. One of the challenges we have providing digital skills training, particularly to beginners, is how to open that conversation because... If you're using TeamViewer, I know it offers a, 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 an option to click on the URL and open a session. Um, but a total beginner, trying to get them to either install the client or use that technical channel to open a remote support session on their device can be a real challenge. So how do you overcome that challenge? How can you overcome it? Right. Well, I would agree with you. First of all, you can't actually do it straight no. away. So one of the things that I've been asked to do is <laughs> you have to build up a rapport over the phone first and you have yeah. to do that through the correct channels. So if I'm working, say um, I'm with Clarion Housing Association, so it'd be like the warden would actually build up the rapport with the resident wants to be helped. And then the warden would sit with the resident by the computer so that I could talk over the phone about there's going to be a link coming in because I can do Windows remote access, providing I've got the IP address. And again, that's a good safety measure because it means that the administration team for the network know that I'm doing remote access so that it's just me. They know it's safe because that's slightly safer than using the normal team viewer because team viewers really for people like you say, a bit more tech savvy. They've already got a computer in place. Hopefully they've updated everything so it'll just launch automatically. But I would actually advise always have the conversations just on a no normal phone call first before you even bother to think about doing remote access. Because first thing I think of is who are you connecting to and how secure is their computer? Because the last thing you want to do is remote access to an infected machine and then infect your own network. So that's one of the things I think of from my engineering point of view as a programmer. I just yeah. think security first. So yeah, use the phone first. Yeah, and, and that's a very good point because um, I believe, and I'm just putting it out there, and it's not representative of uh, um, the organisation I work for, but um, sometimes you have to accept that you can't help a beginner technically yes. as a result of that phone conversation. What you can do is open the conversation to perhaps add them to a waiting list or some sort of uh, record where you can come back to them at a later point when perhaps someone is available to help them yes by pairing that's, up that's exactly or, right yes or you can join up when the pandemic has uh, yes. hopefully reduced in terms of its impact so that's exactly what's on top of my job list is to go into the my facility and set up the machines so that they can have remote access from the other end because we yes. got locked out before I could actually go in and do that. So that's why we're kind of stuck at the moment and I'm relying on the warden, which is a bit unfair on her. Um, okay, thanks for that. That's okay. Yeah, thanks Phil, that's really helpful. David, I think we've got a few more questions. Yeah, I received a couple of questions privately. So just to remind everyone when you are posting on the chat, um, please um, make sure you've selected everyone so everyone can see those questions. Um, I'll read, there was one question from, um, 
Tim, Tim, I think you posted another question actually um, to myself uh, regarding um, Phil's mentioning to look away when um, a learner is inputting a password. Your question, Tim, was isn't there a risk a learner could say a digital, a digital champion may have spotted their password if a, if a secu security issue occurred? So there's always a risk. Is that what you're saying, Tim? Indeed. And, and, and again, I know this is almost the, the sort of given risk. You know, there's always a chance that um, a, a learner could claim if there was, say, for example, they lost something through online banking that you supported them with when you said you looked away. They could say, oh, well, the champion may have looked over my shoulder. Um, so it's really to just get a view on this. Um, I'm sure there are some guidelines that and, yeah. and hopefully the resources that are shared will give us a more definitive viewpoint on this from ICO or NS NCSSC, LISA organisation. But um, what's your view on it, Phil, from your perspective and being out there in the field? Out in the field, the number one rule is I never work alone. So I can basically never be accused because there's always somebody else in the room for me. So that's part of our safeguarding policy. Yeah. So like I say, I've always got a warden with me. When I'm at the, I work in a school as well. So in the IT department, I've always got somebody with me because um, I do either learning assistant role or I do the IT side of things. So again, if I've got somebody with me, we both look away. So there's no way that anything can be sort of compromised for the actual user. Um, if that sort of instance actually happened, we would just have to raise it as an issue. It's as simple as that. And then we would investigate what went wrong. So I know what you mean, because when somebody says to me, I'm creating a brand new password and I say, I look away. They sometimes say, I'm going to write it down. And I say, OK, write it down. They write it down correctly, but they type it in differently. Yeah, it That's is. where we, we get the conundrum of I cannot help because what you've written down isn't what you typed in. And sometimes it's just much easier to say, let's start it again. Let's do password retrieval, reset a new password or reset a new pin. And again, we still have to trust them by looking away because it's just not worth us exposing ourselves to any sort of like compromise position by actually looking and helping them, which is why we will never take hold of the keyboard or the mouse or their device and do it for them. Because that's what families do. They say, granny, I'm going to change your pin granny can't remember the number and then she's locked out and the family member's gone and that's no use to them which is why it's so important that we actually help people so they can do it themselves uh, just a final thing on that. very quick question sorry um have you ever in a session assigned a temporary password just to let that session be completed and yep. then change the password at the end where you get the user to change the password yes have you done that yeah, yeah. It's recommended, it's recommended practice because like yeah. having a temporary account yeah. means it doesn't actually matter. Yeah. And especially with like when we do online shopping, I always say to people, you don't need to use your personal account. If you're worried about getting spammed by all the shops, set up a shopping account with Gmail and just use that for doing shopping. It's much easier and then you don't need to worry. Or even a learner account where you can just use it for a yeah. learning session as such yeah excellent or a series of sessions um, yeah. it, the, the reason i mention this for other people on the call is um having delivered uh, digital skills training to a range of learners a lot of the sort of entry level um resetting a password continuously through a session bec can become a nightmare so tip to everyone setting a temporary password change it at the end of session can save a whole raft of problems. Yes. Um, you, yeah. you, you much better to do that. that. Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Phil and Tim, for the for those. Thank you. Um, those Thank you. Um, I'm just going to pick up one more question from David Sello in Brighton, who sent it privately, um, and this has come up in our local network in um, in, in Brighton and Hove. And um, David is an IT um, Library Connect volunteer there. David, you've got a question about sharing personal email addresses. So if if you your question is around if you're building that trust on the phone with a new learner, um, there might be um, you might end up using email as a communication channel to set up a new appointment or something like that. Um, is what what is best practice around that, Phil, in your experience? Also, yeah, that's also raised. The other one is actually having the personal. You know, you're you're this is an IT volunteer. You've been checked for uh, data. You know, um, for. Um, uh, for the you know before you've done it but 
having information in, from about the client because in this case you're not you're not you're not actually working you're just a volunteer for an organization right. and how yes. much information from, from them have you got uh, um, have you that's why I've, I, I've raised it because I sorted out one on the telephone but there's a thing you can put 141 in front of the telephone number before yeah. you ring it so the person doesn't know your telephone number because it's your private number but yes. there are issues with email addresses yeah here's my answer two phones personal phone nobody knows that work phone that number is the one that could be rung only via my coordinator and anybody else who knows about that number so they're contacting me on a work basis and it's the same with the email accounts that are associated with it so like the work phone has got nothing to do with like the social media that i do personally it's just for the work purposes and then my personal phone is just how I mess around on the internet, basically. So I have a clear demarcation so that I don't need to worry about how many accounts I've got because I personally can't remember how many Gmail accounts I've set up for various clients and for myself. Because sometimes what I will do is I will set up a client account to do, say, some online shopping. And then if there's a problem, I'll link it to a brand new account that I've also got access to in case they lock themselves out so I can get it back. Because with the more advanced users, we use the two-factor authentication process. So once we can get them set up on their mobile phone so that they can't get locked out, then we've got a lot more control because it's actually, you've locked yourself out, never mind, it will send a message to your phone, see that little six-digit number, go in and we can change your password for you. So it just makes life simple. But yeah, for me personally, have two devices, one for home, one for work. Well, while I was working, that was the situation, but... I'm now, you know, doing it as a private thing, having, you yep. know, I have more than one email address. I yep. mean, the other issues I'm, I'm concerned about is actually safeguarding because yep. there's the issue of how much information you should have on the client. Now, it's all right when you're doing Absol it for the company. Absolutely the best. But when you do it as a, as a volunteer, yeah. you've got to be uh, careful. You don't want anything going terribly wrong. And then that's why... Um, I'm raising it because I just think the safeguarding side, even though you've been checked safeguarding, there are still issues about you doing, you know, using each other's personal information. That's right, yes. When I go to a library, people know I'm Phil Brannigan, they know I'm from Digital Unite, and they've got a Digital Unite Outlook account that they can use, and that's it. <laughs> so that's my safeguarding. And then the people that I'm meeting, I know who they are in the first place. So they've been vetted. Sometimes I've just got their first name. I know why they're there. Say so it's something like a job club. And that's all I need to know, basically. And then we just get on with the process of how I'm going to help them to, with my digital skills. So like you say, if we have the bare minimum information, that's, safe, that's safeguarding for all of us. But obviously the organisation, like Clarion Housing Group, they do the vetting. So they've got more of the details just in case there's a problem in the future. Should we move on to the slides on this, David? I think. Yeah, thanks a lot, Phil and David. Um, yeah. I, think, I think this is a, this is a nice segue to safeguarding, which is the next section we'd like to explore. And thanks to others for posting resources, uh, Toby, Karen, and others on the chat. Uh, we will share those in the follow-up. Um, I'll start screen sharing again, and uh, we can look at safeguarding in more detail. Yeah, and we'll have we'll have another discussion after we just do a few slides. So just for anyone who isn't familiar with the concept of what safeguarding is, it's about the fact that the people that we're often helping are occasionally people or often people who are vulnerable for some reason, vulnerable adults. They might be elderly, they might be isolated, or they might have some other kind of reason in their life why they're vulnerable. And safeguarding is about trying to mitigate any risk to that person, taking precautions around the support for that person that you're helping, but also for the volunteers or the, the staff members that are providing that support. And it's important to say that we, in our organization, think of safeguarding as an organizational responsibility. It's not just about the person who's providing the help, although it's important that they think through the risks of the actions that they have when they're supporting others. It's about the people who are line managing them or their colleagues in the organization and how you work a kind of a system within the organization to, to manage these issues. So one aspect of that is that organizations that are supporting vulnerable people and we would say any organization doing digital skills work is is under that definition should have a safeguarding policy and reporting procedures for any kind of concerns that might be raised either by a 
a member of staff or by a learner themselves or a volunteer. So I think in the next slide, we've got a um, poll just to find out a little bit more about those of you on the call and what your situation is. Um, the questions on this are, or sort of the answers on this are that you've got a safeguarding policy. You've got a safeguarding policy that specifically talks about remote digital support and issues around that. That your organization doesn't have a safeguarding policy or that you don't work for an organization and therefore, you know, it's not relevant for you. Um, some of you who don't work for an organization might nonetheless in a similar way to, to Phil, you might be a volunteer for an organization that has a policy. So, you know, you can, you can use the options above if you're in that situation, but if you're really removed from this, then there is that fourth option. So we've got about 23 people have voted. We've still got another 10 or so to vote. There's 37 of you on the call at the moment. So we'll just wait a few more seconds to give you time to select an option. few more uh, we'll just give another few seconds Got 30 voted now out of 37 let's leave it there so most of you 80% 24 people have got a safe binding policy at their organization but what's interesting is only two identify that you've got a remote digital support aspect to that so hopefully what I'm about to present will be helpful to you um, then we've got a couple there that say you don't have a safeguarding policy at all, which is also interesting, and a couple who, who don't work for an organisation. So hopefully what I'm about to say will be useful. So this is just a, a quick screenshot of uh, the intro to our safeguarding policy that we have at Citizens Online. And like with some of the other resources, I will share this round in the email so you can all have a look at it. Um, we've recently updated this because of COVID and because of remote digital support. So we've talk, I've already talked about some of the things that this covers, you know, roles and responsibilities of everyone in the organization, things like that. But if we go through to the next slide, I can talk about some of the specific things that are raised at the moment by remote digital support. So one aspect is that people might be more vulnerable because of the current circumstances. They might be shielding, they might be self-isolating, or they might just be staying at home, reducing their contact with other people in order to try and reduce the spread of the virus. They might be working from home and no longer going out very much. And that has consequences. It means that people might be more vulnerable to um, things that happen when they do have interactions with others. They're less in contact with groups that might be able to, they might be able to talk to about issues that are raising. And importantly, when we're providing one-to-one -one sessions with those people, they're now occurring in private rather than public settings. Phil mentioned that when he normally provides support, it's always with at least one other person. But beyond that, we're often providing support in libraries or um, job center locations where there are a lot of people there. And that means that there are kind of eyes on what's happening and that um, it's more difficult for anyone to make accusations or for it's less likely that something's going to occur but it also means that you as a volunteer or someone providing support could identify anything that was happening in that location that was a threat or risk to the, the vulnerable adult that you're working with and at the moment you're not going to be in that position you won't be able yourself to see if they're um, potentially being um, badly treated by another organization however it might be the case that because you're talking to them in private, they are more willing to tell you about negative experiences they're having. So it might be that you have information that you are required to pass on to report to your organization that they've disclosed to you. Not information that you've sought, I should emphasize, but information that they may give to you because they feel they're in a safer environment than they might normally do. We've talked a little bit about contact details already. Um, Providing remote digital support does probably mean that there's more demand for contact details to be shared. As Phil said, there's ways that we can um, mitigate the risks involved with that. We can set up distinct email addresses. We can hide phone numbers when we're calling people. But you will probably still need to give someone a phone number that they can call you on. So, you know, there's something, there's, there's an issue that needs to be addressed here. Lastly, um, we talked a little bit just now with that question from Tim about, you know, um, 
learners potentially suggesting that someone did look at their password or something like that. Now this um, solution that video tools can enable recording of se sessions doesn't necessarily solve that entirely and it isn't something we'd say you should do um, by default but it is something that you can offer as an option for anyone who is a volunteer or a staff member who wants to have that um, sense of security for themselves or for any learners that would like the session to be recorded. So that is a kind of benefit of providing remote digital support in a way. Moving on to some recommendations. We at Citizens Online say that anyone who's helping people to get online who's an official member of staff or a volunteer with us should have a DDS check. At the moment with COVID response, a lot of organizations are kind of doing urgent or emergency response and may have a different system. They may want to apply some other risk assessment temporarily to ensure that they can provide help in the immediate future and then sort DBS checks out at a later date. And that's gonna be something that an organization will have to do its own sort of risk assessment around. With phone support, um, some of the things we recommend are just maintaining a professional approach. It might seem obvious, but it can feel providing support in a different way that some of the basic things we might normally do feel different and, and having a phone conversation, someone can feel more informal than it might otherwise do. So maintaining a professional approach could include things like having a script that you want to read out to learners at the start that just reminds them of certain um, important aspects of how that support's being provided and their privacy. As we've said already, if you don't wanna share your phone number, you can hide it by dialing 141 beforehand. With video conferencing tools like Zoom, um, it's worth being aware of the security risks with them and following best practice. You've all experienced a bit of that today, I think, because um, we, when we use Zoom, we use password protected um, Zoom links and we don't share the link publicly. We only share the link with people who've registered for the session. Both those things are measures to prevent people who we don't want joining the call from joining it, the sort of Zoom bomber thing that you'll have, you'll have probably heard about in the news. Um, the issue that came up today is that, of course, you should regularly change the passwords you use. Um, and I changed the password for next week's session. And unfortunately, that changed the password for this week's session retrospectively and potentially locked some of you out for a little while. Um, finally, remote control tools and screen sharing. We've again talked about these a little bit. Um, as Phil said, you know, it's best if we can build up a rapport with people through using the phone first. Certainly, you'd want to always be asking the user's permission before connecting to their computer. With something like TeamViewer, you can explain to people that it's a very temporary access. You know, you get a one-time code to be able to do it, that sort of thing. Um, these tools can be really useful, and it's a bit tricky, basically, to identify. It's going to be very case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes remote control tools are going to be exactly what you need right at the start of someone's um, journey into digital skills to help them get set up but on the whole we would nonetheless still recommend trying to delay the point where you use those those tools someone's asked in the in the chat at that point what level dbs do you do um, we don't we're not doing enhanced checks at the moment i don't think dbs are doing them i think there's because of increased demand for dbs checking they're not doing the enhanced checks at the moment and i don't think we we've ever done them as a um a rule in assistance or another though i'll need to check that and um, make sure i put that out in the email when we when we send it out to you later so i think that's the slides um we'd now open it up to gallery view again if you can turn your video on please do and we'll We'll have any more questions that people have about safeguarding and if not questions then you're very welcome just to share some experiences from how your organizations have dealt with these issues and any challenges that have come up so let's just let's have a look through these Yeah, okay, so we've got a couple more from Tim. Tim, do you want to just, um, if I unmute you, do you want to ask those? Sorry, I don't want to dominate the discussion. It's just a couple of put up, so apologies. Um, obviously, there's guidance out there on using Zoom uh, for video conferencing. Um, it would be useful, I just put the question out there, if someone's got a link to the definitive 
uh, guidance we can use. I presume it is Zoom, the, the, the manufacturers as such, the suppliers, but sort of practical guidelines we can use for a, a Zoom remote session with our learners. Not a business Zoom, but a learning Zoom, a, a remote support Zoom. If anyone's got a link to that or, or something they found out there, I'd, I'd appreciate sight of it. That'd be really good. So that was the first thing, more a question on that. The second thing is, um, I just wondered whether, again, in the field, whether people have found a really good remote support learning tool or platform that's really good for supporting learners with digital skills. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there, um, but if anyone has any views on some really killer platforms or apps that help in that area, that would be really helpful as well. So again, you know, if, if, if people could share that at some point, not necessarily now, but you know, in the feedback on the links or whatever, that'd be really useful. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the short answer I can give is that um, one of the things we're, I'll show you shortly is our coronavirus support resources page on our website does have some stuff around video conferencing, including Zoom. Um, I'm not sure it's exactly what you're after, Tim. I think um, Digital Unite have put something out about Zoom calls with learners specifically, I think. So I'll have to dig that out. Maybe Phil can uh, let me know if I'm right about that. Um, and then in terms of uh, bespoke tools for learning, I don't think I've seen anything on that. So it'd be great to hear from anyone else. TeamView is the one we hear most commonly referred to, and it's what we use at work internally. So it's what we're familiar with. Um, oh, just to add to that, James, um, Tim, there's a, we, we've, in our uh, safeguarding policy, when we updated it regarding uh, remote support, we added about, I think, seven tips for hosts in terms of making sure we're covering risk and managing risk from the host perspective and I think four or five from the participants perspective so I'll dig that out and make sure we can share that in the follow-up there's also a blog from zoom um, they were they had, were having a lot of issues with uninvited guests uh, like James mentioned lots of zoom bombing sessions they've put a blog together uh, not too long ago I don't think I'll share it in the chat now um, and then we there's some good there are some good sessions recordings of sessions uh, run by uh, training organizations so we've done uh, we've done a couple of uh, sessions with diversity and ability uh, who do some work with uh, around assistive tech and supporting uh, people with disabilities in using tech so they're very experienced at providing that remote support um, they did uh, a session uh, covering some of those tips with zoom in terms of using it as a training tool and also whereby so a slightly lighter um, more um, Sort of easily accessible a platform uh, we'll find that online it's either on our website or on theirs and we'll share it in the follow-up yes yeah you can watch the um, recording of that session and it's really good for some soft skills around remote support uh, it's worth saying I've been playing around with using whereby a little bit lately and it's it's a little restrictive in terms of the browsers that it wants people to have so um, you, you want to be checking with people what they've got before you suggest they use it because otherwise you can have quite a frustrating experience um, but it is a lighter touch system because you don't need to download anything to use it and you can do screen sharing um, If yeah with some caveats around the browsers that you're using So uh, I don't think you can do remote support through it, but it is a nice a nice tool I'm just noticing in the chat there that Paul is saying that uh, Digital Unite do have some basic guides on Zoom, but they generally um, signpost to Zoom's own guides, which she's saying are good, which is, has been my experience broadly in terms of those those basic things about setting up setting up your Zoom meetings with a with a password protected link, and not sharing the the Zoom link publicly. Those are two really easy, simple tips that we can all we can all do as as hosts and people who are who are receiving Zoom links, uh, not passing them on. Is something to bear in mind. I think we might we might leave it there, David. Perhaps should we do the um, the outro slides because we're we're ten to twelve now, and it will take me a while to go through these. So these are just some resources that we've put together before the call, so they won't necessarily cover everything that people have asked about, but are hopefully useful. So first off, uh, Digital and I have got lots of guides that are freely available on aspects of privacy and security and the settings and how you can help learners with them. Things like adjusting privacy settings in Windows 10, 
generic advice about staying safe online and specific tips for smartphone security, but a whole range of other things as well. Um, one of the things at the moment that's sort of tangentially relevant to this conversation is reliable health information. Um, we've been signposting people to the NHS website, but also a couple of WhatsApp services. Um, PHE have an English language one and the World Health Organization have a whole range of languages available. They're simple to access if you've got learners who've, who are using WhatsApp, which is quite common. Directing them can be really helpful. And then similarly, scams is one of the things that comes up. Unfortunately, there are unscrupulous people who try to take advantage at times like these. Age UK have a good page on scams and fraud generally, including who to contact if you think you have been scammed, which have a good page on coronavirus scams in particular, which I think is regularly updated when new ones come up. And finally, there's a specific fact-checking service, Invitagion, which is, provides really good short summary responses to some of the things that go around the internet very quickly. Then we've got some information about privacy and safety, which I mentioned earlier, our blog post, which just links to that Oxford Internet Institute research and the Dot Everyone work. And our other resources, which are generic resources about helping someone take their first steps online. I think we've got some stuff in this blog post about basics of privacy and security. And then we've got, I think the next one is, ah, well, the next one is just a reminder about Digital Unite. One other thing to say about Digital Unite at the moment is that as well as their guides and resources and top tips for remote support that um, Phil pointed to one of their guides at the moment, they've got others of those. They've also got free access to the Digital Champions Network at the moment, which provides lots of support and resources for you if you're helping learners. We've got this page, which I referred to earlier, which is divided into different sections, one of which is about video conferencing, which I was talking about, but another of which is about privacy and security specifically. We might have time on the call for me to just show you what that looks like. And then I just wanted to advertise next week's session. I don't know if Bob is still with us. Um, Bob, you could say hello at this point. We're going to be talking about digital exclusion and health inequalities and the particular reports of digital skills support around digital health during the pandemic. And we're going to be joined by Bob Gann. Bob, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself if you are still on the call? I'll unmute you. Yeah, hi, I've um, enjoyed the session so far. Thanks for um, all the really useful tips on that. Looking forward to um, participating in the discussion next week around uh, digital exclusion and health inequalities. Um, I'm a, a consultant in uh, digital inclusion, particularly working around the whole inequalities area. Been pleased to work with Systems Online recently uh, and uh, we'll be talking next week about how, on the one hand, uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic has led to a real growth in in digital health and on the other hand the risk of leaving behind the people who most uh, might benefit from that so looking forward to sharing that with you next week right thanks bob for doing that off the cuff sorry to put you on the spot um you can register for that event already if you go to citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events and the last slide here is just uh, our contact details myself and david I'm james.beecher at citizensonline.org.uk if you have got any questions and you'll get an email from me later with follow up with David's email address in it as well. Um, it probably is just worth quickly doing the last few that I had on here, David, because um, Phil did mention, oh, this is a slightly different one. Dot everyone, you'll get this research if you want to from the, um, the blog post I mentioned, just talking about their recommendations in terms of improving um, privacy and security for everyone in terms of regulation and what tech companies can be doing. Um, but actually, I wanted the next ones. Yeah, Phil mentioned about um, the BT Basic offer. Um, for people who are really at a basic level, Digital Unite have got some useful stuff about broadband. We're often recommending to people um, mobile dongles that they could use rather than getting a fixed broadband connection. It'd be cheaper potentially to get a dongle and pay, pay for data bundles. I know a lot of organizations are paying for SIMs at the moment. 
and um, we've got some information collated there about all the websites that people can access that have been zero rated so they don't count towards their data allowance on a mobile phone and then the bt basic offer um as phil mentioned there is a, a sort of 10 pound a month offer it's not not as generous as other things that you could buy but it's certainly pretty good for a third of the cost probably of a normal fixed broadband contract as phil said you do have to have certain um, you do need to be claiming certain benefits and there is a slight irony in the fact that to be on one of these benefits you need to apply online universal credit usually you would need to apply online it's just worth something worth thinking about if you're helping learners who might be able to apply for those benefits or might be on them and might appreciate a, a cheaper broadband offer and um, yeah there's the details of how you get that and we'll be talking about more about this one next week our, um, our digital health kind of so thanks everyone for joining um nice to see you all again and hopefully see many of you next week and in future <laughs>